welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Stand on your feet, let's go before the Lord. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord, and we're grateful that we get to boldly approach the throne of grace. We are here to hear from the teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and the honor. Thank you, Lord, that as you bless us today, we ask that you would bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory as you bless them also. Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. If you will, go with me to Hebrews in the 8th chapter. If you're making notes, the title of the message is When God Communicates. For a lot of people, they don't understand that God, throughout thousands of years, has been trying to talk to man. And God wants to communicate with you and I because he loves us so much. Oftentimes we don't realize the depth of his communication. Or do we realize the love he has for us in the effort that he makes to communicate to us. When God speaks to you and communicates to you, he would not have light little crazy words like, How are you? It's good to see you. How have you been? Nice to be around you. He wouldn't talk that way. When God communicates to you, he has a desire in his heart to express to you on how to do life and do life his way. Since the very fall of Adam and Eve, it's obvious that man wants to do life man's way. And when you do life man's way, you come up with the wrong directions that take you to the wrong place, and at the end of your life, you're frustrated. But if you do life God's way, his will, his desires, you end up life blessed in every area of your life, in your home, in your family, in your children, in your finances. You get blessed in everything that you do. And God loves you so much that he knows that even right after the fall of Adam and Eve, immediately, first thing he did was communicate with them, talk to them. And he's been trying to do that for thousands of years and every level so that we could make sure we don't miss the very will of God, the very plan of God that's going to take us from just being a people that exist on this planet to a people that are absolutely blessed walking in the fullness that God paid for on that cross at Calvary. A lot of times we just don't understand that. That God wants to in such a way communicate to you that his way, his will, his desires become our way, our will, our desire, and the plan of God is fulfilled through our life, and we, we, we are the recipients of it. The blessings that you desperately want. You've worked all your life, you've educated all your life, you've listened to bosses, you've followed things, you've taken risks. You want to be blessed, and yet blessings don't come by your effort here on the planet. Blessings come with a relationship with God, and then God opens the doors to those blessings, and we've missed that completely. And it all starts with what God wants to do with you and me. And as I read from these verses, they say a lot. We've already talked a lot about them. But I want to take you to one particular verse that you can understand about the communication of God. But let's start, if you will, in verse number 7 of the 8th chapter of Hebrews, and I'll read it out loud. And I want you to listen closely and not let your minds wander. And then today we're going to look at some great things in the Word of God that you're going to see. And it's going to be a great revelation for you. Verse number 7 starts off with this. It says this. For if that first covenant 
had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. Stop right there. Look back up at me. I have never read anywhere in the Bible where God took them by their hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. I have never heard one Israeli who was in bondage to Egyptian armies ever make one statement that they ever felt like God was taking them by their hand and leading them out of Egypt. And yet God makes this statement. He says, when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. I wonder how many of us are being led by God right now by our hand according to God and we don't even know it. And we don't even recognize it. We don't even see that God has got a future for us, a destiny for us, and a plan to be fulfilled inside of us. And we are wondering even where God's at when in fact God is leading us to our promised land and he's taken us by our hand and we don't even know that. We continue reading. Verse number 9, it says these words. Because they did not continue in my covenant. Let me repeat that to you. Very important that you get this. Listen, don't let your mind wander. Because they did not continue in my covenant. My covenant means in the ways that I have for them, in the life that I have for them, in the agreement I have for them, in the blessings I have for them. In the, in the things that I promised them, they didn't continue in it. He says, because they didn't continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. In other words, I sought them. They didn't think much of me. And I decided not to think much of them. That's a shock. People whom he loved. People whom he wanted to prosper. People whom he wanted to take care of and provide for whom he wanted to meet their needs and be there at every turn of the road, they are now disregarded because they disregarded the things of God. That's a shock, my friends. The word of God comes in verse number 10. It says, for this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After these days, says the Lord... I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. That's a powerful statement, what he just said. In other words, he just said, I will communicate with them differently than I communicated with them in the past. This time I will put it in their minds and I will take my laws and I will put it in their heart and they will be my people and I will be their God. Wow. You see those words if they're my laws? When I say that, most people that attend American churches would say, he's talking about the Ten Commandments, not what he's talking about. He's not exclusively talking about that, even though he does incorporate that in that. Here's what it means, my laws. It means simply this. It's the will, the way, and if you will, the desire of God for mankind. God has a plan that we can follow. If we do not follow the plan of God, then we find ourselves making decisions based on our own thinking, just like Adam and Eve, and we find ourselves destroyed in a place we don't want to be, and then we get frustrated with God. And they, because they didn't pay attention to what God had said, God disregarded them. And when you see the words, I will put my laws in their heart, listen to this, and in their mind, he's really saying, I will put my way, my will, my desire for mankind inside of them. That will give them the right track to the right future. That is the blessings that I had originally planned for them. 
Without it, my friends, we fail. We'll come back to verse number 10 in a moment. Let me just conclude the chapter by just reading verse number 11. It says, For none of them shall teach his neighbor and none of the, his brothers, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and to their sins and their lawless deeds, and I, I will remember them no more. In that he says, a new covenant he has made, the first absolute, absolute. Now, what has become absolute is growing old and is ready to vanish away. Now, if God wants to give us a new way of speaking to us, to communicate with us by placing his will and his way, his desires, or, let me put it simply, his word in our hearts, then we need to understand how this works. Let me take you, if I may, to the book of James in the first chapter, verse number 21. And I want you to understand, I'll put it up on the overheads for you. It's talking about receiving the word of God, and it says that you need to receive with meekness. Now here's the problem with a lot of people. A lot of people that attend American churches do not receive the word of God with meekness. Meekness means you're flexible, means you're pliable. Doesn't mean you're stiff necked, questioning, doubting. It means you're ready to absorb. And it's a meek spirit that says, I hear what God is saying and I want what God has. And therefore, I'm going to receive it. He says, You've got to receive the Word of God or the will or the way or the desires of God that gives us insight on how to live life. And I need to receive it with meekness. And then he comes along and he calls it the implanted word, which is able to save your souls or bless your life. One translation, if you have the old King James, engrafted. means it's like, if you will, scratched in, an engrafting tool. But the word implanted is an interesting word. Now stop and think about this. God wants to do something. He wants to take his will, his way, and his desires. And here's what he wants to do with them. He wants to do something wonderful with them. He wants to put them not on a page, but he wants to put them not on printed material. He wants to take them and put them into our heart, engrafted into us, or implanted into us. A lot of people have implants. They have, uh, if you will, retina implants and hearing implants and, and uh, implants with the heart and lots of products and people. Implant is a word that we use oftentimes in American culture. It's just part of our society nowadays. And it means taking something from the outside and putting it on the inside. And God wants to take something from the outside and, and do something with it. He wants to take his word, his will, his way, his desires for you so that you can make the right decisions, go in the right place, and get him blessed in your life. He wants to take that away from just the page of the book and place it in your heart. Wow. Yeah. And when you do this, it becomes part of you. It isn't just something you do. When the word is implanted in you, it becomes part of you. It's now yours. Along with this comes a responsibility that a lot of people don't know. I'm going to bring to your attention in Luke, the 12th chapter, verse number 48. Last part of this verse says it like this. For everyone who much is given, from him much be will be required. Now, let's just stop right there and think about this for a moment. I want you to concentrate with me, and I want you to follow me just for a moment. In the Old Testament, we found those people that were disregarded of God because they didn't treat the covenant the right way, right? We read that a number of times. Now he makes this statement, for everyone who is given much, from him much will be required. In other words, if you're giving something, you're going to be required something. If you're giving nothing, you're required nothing. If you're giving a lot, you'll be required a lot. Last part of the verse kind of says it again. He says, and to whom much has been committed of him will he ask even the more. 
Now, here's what I say about the American church. We've been given everything. We've given the greatest gift that could ever be given, the Son of God, creator of the heavens and the earth, that paid the price. No devil in hell ever paid the price for you. He paid the price for your beaten, bloody mess, walking down the street, nailed to the cross, took your sins and mine forever so that we can have the information that God wants to communicate to us so that we can live the life that God would have us to live. And there's a responsibility that goes to it for whom God has given something to. We've got to do something with it. If we don't, then we will be just like others, disregarded. Are you following me? A lot of people don't see it that way, don't understand that way, but that's really the way it is. I want to share with you some things. I want to look through the time of God and how he communicated with people through time. Really loves us enough to do this. Laws of God throughout time. If I could say laws of God throughout time, then I could say the will, the way, and the desire of God throughout time. How is God going to communicate to a people that don't have communication on their heart or desire for anything? How does he communicate with the people who don't know him? How does he communicate with the people that don't listen? God loves us so much that throughout time he has made different ways for us to hear and get his will, his way, his desire, so that we can be blessed. It all starts, it's fascinating, by looking at the Word of God. God will write. Remember how he was going to write on our hearts? That's a form of communication. God will write the simplest form that goes back thousands of years is God writes who he is in nature. You say, Pastor Jim, what does that mean? I don't understand that at all. Have you ever stopped and looked at a sunset with the clouds in the sky and watched the sky turn multiple colors? And you said to yourself, oh my goodness, what beauty is that? Have you ever stopped and smelled the flowers and the fragrance? Have you ever seen the silhouette of pine trees against the mountain at a sunset? Have you ever smelled, if you will, the world around you? You know it's wonderful, and you just know without a shadow of a doubt that God is there. The Bible makes it very clear that through nature, he makes himself known to everybody. Some people just resist it and don't see it as if it's God. In Psalms, the 19th chapter, verse number 1, this is stated. We're talking about God wanting to communicate with you throughout time so that we can get the will, the way, the desire of God. Why? So that we can be what God would have us to be and do what God would have us to do. Why? So that we can live the life that God has presented to us so that we can be blessed. But if we do not hear that God wants to talk to us, we find ourselves a mess. Here it is in Psalms 19.1. Here, look at nature. And the writer, of course, is David. The heavens declare the glory. You see the word glory means manifested goodness of God. Glory does not mean some Shekinah firework sparkly presentation. The word glory means the manifested goodness of God. You and I are the manifested goodness of God. We are the West Coast distributor of God's glory, uh, his manifested goodness as Christians. And he says the heavens, not some preacher, not some guy in the tree, not some guy on television, not somebody over here or there, but the heavens themselves declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork and his goodness. In Romans, the second chapter, just in verse number 20 alone, it makes this statement also. We're talking about how God communicates throughout time. The first was nature. Didn't have a book, didn't have television, didn't have anything. God wanted to tell the people something. He is there. 
And here in Romans, the second, first chapter, verse number 20 says it like this. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Clearly seen his attributes. My goodness. How? Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead. You can see the power in the Godhead itself. How? So that they are without excuse. How? From the invisible attributes, they are clearly seen the creation of the world. That's why when you look at a sunset, when you look at something that's beautiful, when you smell the fragrances of blossoms in the springtime, all of a sudden there's something that hits you that says there's a God that created it, a good God that had a good plan. And the number one basic way that God communicates to a lost and dying world is through nature. The second one is very interesting. We're talking about the laws of God through time and how he wants to communicate. And the second way of communication throughout the thousands of years is in man's conscience. There's just something inside of us. We just know what's right and what's wrong. We just have, you know, when you have done something wrong, you just know it. You just feel it. It's in our conscience that we would know this basic understanding of what's right and what's wrong. In Romans, the second chapter, there's a grouping of verses that are so powerful. We're talking about number one, nature, number two, our conscience. But in Romans, the second chapter, there's a group of verses that are powerful. Let me get there because I want to read them uh, right out of the word of God with you. So go there with me in your Bible, Romans, the second chapter, if you will, verse number 11. For there is no partiality with God. In other words, God doesn't favor you more than he favors anybody else. He doesn't look at Billy Graham and think of Billy Graham as greater than you. Can you imagine that? God loves us all the same. And then he makes a statement in verse number 12. For as many that have sinned without the law. Now wait a minute. Stop right there. Look back up at me. For as many that have sinned without the law, without the desire, without the will, without the ways of God. And many people have lived their life for themselves and have lived without the law. Watch these words. Will also perish without the law. In other words, if someone keeps doing what's contrary to the ways of God, they will perish from the ways that are contrary to God. And he goes along, verse number 12, he says this, and as many that sinned in the law, in other words, they have the will, the way, but they keep on living their life without God. Those are the ones he disregarded before. Do you remember that? And then he comes along and he makes this, uh, the sin in the law will be judged by what they have. Do you remember that? Too much is given, much is what? Required. And all of a sudden we have something and we don't live by it, then we're going to be judged by what we don't live by and what we have. Wow. But verse 13 is a parenthesis. He stops right there and clarifies the verse. Because here's how it works. I love verse 13. It says this, for not the hearer of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doer of the law will be justified. In other words, if you take the word law up there and put the will, the ways, the desires of God for mankind, and the one who hears that is not justified because he hears it, but you're justified if you do it. And the high courts of heaven, the word justified means you're in a place of justice. The high courts of heaven and the gavel comes down based on what you have and what's been given to you. And like the children of Israel, what was given to them, they disregarded and they became disregarded. And for us, when we've been given something and we disregard it, we'll still be judged by what we're given, not by how we act. And in this particular case, if you don't do it, come on, somebody. 
But verse 14, don't go there. It gets really wild. Verse 14. We're talking about, listen to this, conscience. It's the second way that God wanted to communicate through our conscience. Verse 14, it says, For when Gentiles, see the word Gentiles there? The word Gentile means people without God. Gentiles. For when Gentiles who do not have people without God, they do not have the will, the way, nor do they have the desire of God for their life, by nature do the things that are of God, the law. Although not having the will, way, and desire of God are a law to themselves. Have you ever heard that someone as a new Christian, we always ask the question, how do you get saved? Someone says, oh, you got to get saved by Jesus. You say, oh, yes, you do. you got to be saved by Jesus. The Bible says that. And then we always ask this question, well, what about the guy on some remote island in the South Pacific who doesn't even hear the name of Jesus, never knew the name of Jesus, never had a chance to even get the name of Jesus? What about him? And then we all, in our smugness, say, well, he goes to hell. Does that sound like God to you? But this verse makes it very clear that a guy without God, Gentile, who does not have the law by nature does the things that are of God. What if he doesn't? The law says, those, although not having the ways of the Lord, are a law to themselves. And then he goes on and explains it, verse 15. Watch verse 15. Who show the works of the ways of God written in their hearts. Didn't know God. But in their conscience, something happened. Their conscience also bearing witness. There was something on the inside of them that said, man, there is a God. Now look, I'm not coming up with some radical, crazy, cultish, goofball idea that's changing uh, Christian theology. I'm just challenging some of the stupid theology that's out there. Because according to this, it says this, their conscience will bear witness between themselves. Their thoughts will either accuse them in the high courts of heaven or else excuse them. Wow. Now look, so, so when someone asks you, what about that guy in the islands in the South Pacific you never hear about the name of Jesus? My answer to that is that ain't you. You heard the name and now you're responsible because of whoever much is given. But, and then I say this, then I say this, then I, then I say this, and I say, and God will take care of that person. Let God be God. Are you following me? And God in his justice knows what to do. Is everybody listening? Sometimes some of this Christian theology makes me crazy, even though we're Christian church. But I, you know, I've been, I'm an old man. I can fight this stuff. Nobody says anything. My hair's gray, I've been doing this for 50 years. So I, I, you know, I can look at stuff and say stuff. So what, what can I tell you? And I'm pushing 70. Who's gonna argue with a 70 year old? <laughs> so here it says this, which is really fascinating to me. So the conscience plays a mighty thing. The third way, now here's God, he's in the heavens. He says, I have tried to communicate through nature, and they're not getting it very good. I have tried to communicate with their conscience, and they're not getting it very good. I know what I'll do. I'll bring them out of Egypt, and I'll take Moses to the mountain, and I'll write my will, my ways, and my desires for them so they can live a life that will be prosperous and successful, all they have to do. And I, I won't write it on parchment, and I won't write it on the skins of animal. I'll edge it into a stone tablet. You know what I'm talking about. You saw the movie. <laughs> Moses comes down from the mountain, right? Okay, so let's take a look at that Exodus. 
Pop up Exodus 24, chapter verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and there, and I will give you. Remember, he's always trying to communicate. Why? Because he loves us. Why? He's eternally committed to your success. And he says, I will, I will give you tablets of stone and the law in which I have written that you may teach them. Because he wants them to know, like you and I today, what in the heck is the will, way of God? What's the desire? So that I can, and then he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to follow. Did it work? No. So here's nature doing a pretty good job. Doesn't take us deep enough. Here's our conscience. Some people got that. Didn't take us deep enough. Here's written on stone. Didn't get the job done. Now God says there's an ultimate in the last place, which is written in your heart. Now watch this. Again, Hebrews, the eighth chapter, verse 10, which is our original verse. He says, I will put the laws, my will, my way, my desire in their mind and write them, communicate to them, endless of this, on their hearts, and they will be, I will be their God, and they will be my people. And there's such a difference when the things of God are implanted on the inside of us and become part of us. We make decisions based on what's on the inside of us, not based on emotion, not based on what our parents do, not based on what society says, not based on what the economics say, not based on what uh, social systems dictate, not based on anything else, but something on the inside of us has been implanted and we make decisions, get directions in places, do things all based on because he's implanted on the inside of us and as we receive his will, his way, his desire. And a lot of people go to church and they turn their brains off. And they hear some reader's digest suggestion from some big mouth preachers about nothing. And they never get that word in their minds that drops down in their heart that becomes part of their life. So when there comes time to live this out, it's still written in ink on the paper instead of in the heart. Now, I did all of this for this reason. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. Why is this important? Why does it mean something to you? Why should you see how hard throughout the times that God has been trying to communicate to us so that we get it? Why is it important? Watch. Second Corinthians, third chapter, verse two. You are our letter. The word epistle means letter. Written in our hearts. This is the apostle speaking to the church. Written in our hearts. Known speaking of the church. And read by all men. What does that mean? All of a sudden, you become the witness that all men read. 45 years ago, 50 years ago, or something like that, I don't even remember. I went to my family, a family that's very well as far as business goes, own downtown Los Angeles, not too shabby. And I said, I'm not going there. I, I want to be a minister and serve God. I actually was going to go overseas in the mission fields. And, I, and I'm going to be a pastor, a minister. My family looked at me and said, you've got to be kidding. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard there's no money in pastoring. What does even pastoring mean? That's how stupid they were. Today, all these years later, I was the epistle they read 
And every time there's a problem in the family, first one they call, you know who? When there's situations that need answers, guess who they call? They used to laugh at me. Now they want to hear. Why? Because I've been read by all men. Why? Because the word of God. Now watch this about you. Watch this, which takes us to verse 3. Clearly, you are a letter of Christ, meaning you. Ministered by us. Yes, the uh, apostles gave us the information. Written not in ink but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. He defines it. That is of the heart. So when the Word of God goes from that page and it drops into here and drops down here, it becomes implanted. And then when I live it out, I'm not only successful and prosperous and blessed in every area of my life, but I become the epistle that everybody around me reads. To a lost and dying world that is headed for hell, you're the only book they will read. Come on, somebody. That's the reason why he wanted to take it from a stone or from nature or from your conscience and drop it in the depths of your heart. And that's why when you come to church like this, this church, I don't know about the others, bless them. But when you come to this church, man, get your Bible. We're learning how to be a letter read by the world. Somebody come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't that good? Just let me talk to you just for a moment. Jesus makes this statement. You must be born again. If you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to be born again. Most people hear that and they turn off immediately because they don't understand it. Hollywood has made born again people look like idiots and fools and radicals. That's not what we're talking about. Born again means this from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ, always has been, always will be. All or nothing with God. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking. He said, I'm coming again, and you know he is. And he says, and when I come, I better find you hot, or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. What a crude, rude statement Jesus just made. But he's in their face saying it like it is. And someone needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough to get in your face. It is. You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life. You got to give it to him because he's not a thief. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. It's your heart and life. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. It's your heart and life. And today, here we are in this safe, friendly place. We have laughed, we've clapped, we've sung songs. Man, you were great listening to the Word of God today. Uh, so far, of all the three other services before you, you are the best listening. Well, I won't tell them that. <laughs> but today is your day of salvation. You haven't given God yet all your heart. Oh, wait a minute. You know Him in your head. You celebrate Easter every year. Of course, you know about the resurrection. You know about the baby in the manger. You're not against God, but you're no, not wholehearted for God, and that's a lukewarm. And today is your day of salvation. You gotta give him all of your heart. You gotta get, I can't do it for you. You gotta give him all of your life. You already know who he is. You know that in your conscience. And now it's time to say, here's my heart, God. You gave me your heart. Here's my life, God. You gave me your life. And today is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms that are packed out, in the foyer by television, and you're in the courtyard listening to me on those speakers, I'm talking to you. Today is your day of salvation by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. Listen to me. I already know you know who what I'm talking about. I already know you know you need to get right with God. 
So stop messing with God and just do it because today's your day. You say, Pastor, I'll be embarrassed. No, you won't. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. You can put it right back down. That simple. Just raising your hand saying, I want to give all my heart and life to Jesus. You can put it right back down. Be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. All across this auditorium, are you ready? I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up all over. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? We'll do it all at the same time. My hands are already going up. We'll, uh, you haven't given him, are you running to him instead of to him? Today's your day. If you've never given him all of your heart, you know who you are, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, you know, you think you gave him your heart, but you never followed up with your life, today's your day. If you're not sure, make sure. Today's your day. Is that okay? I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Let's go. All in this place. Are you ready? Here it is. One. Two. Three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. Back over here. Twelve. Thank you. Thirteen. Fourteen. Thank you. Fifteen. Sixteen. Thank you. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Thank you. Twenty-one. Thank you. Twenty-two. Back over on this side. Thank you. Twenty-two. Twenty-three. Twenty-four. Okay. All of you. Everybody that's raised your hand. Anybody that should have raised your hand. Everybody that raised your hand. Anybody that should have raised your hand. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to. Sit next to somebody check with them and say come on friend I'll go with you I want you to get your stuff if you're serious about God get your stuff get in the aisle no one leave during this period of time get in the aisle meet me right here in front let's all stand and welcome them as they come you come right now come on come 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 Won't you come just as you are come on home come on home come on home Come and give them a hand as they come. They're coming, give them a hand as they come. Forever he'll give you life. Everlasting. Oh, they're coming, give them a hand as they come. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. You're not going to the morgue. You get to go to heaven. <laughs> that ought to make you happy. Look over here to the left. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a good guy. He's going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Listen to me. You don't, you, you, you don't get Jesus in your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. Now he's a gentleman and you need to invite him in. He'll lead you in a prayer to do that. Second, he's going to give you some free information about what to do next. Now that you're a Christian, what in the world does God want from me? What does he expect from me? Ah, that information, will, he'll give it to you free. Thirdly, he's going to tell you about a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Only takes a few moments. Is that okay? People you came with, they'll wait for you. So don't go back to your seat unless you don't want to do this. But if you're serious about God, just make a left turn, follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood 
washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.